Welcome. My name is Melvin Rogers. I'm an associate professor of political science at Brown University. Let me first thank Aaron and Scott uh, for the invitation to give these two lectures at the Summer Institute of American Philosophy. I'm quite honored. Um, and let me apologize to all of you that I'm not there in person um, uh, to join you. Since we have a good ways to go, let me just jump into the lectures, and I hope you'll find something um, uh, interesting and rich in what I will say to you today. When Frederick Douglass, now in the twilight of his life, reflected on the abolitionist movement, he acknowledged David Walker as one of its earliest defenders. There were, to be sure, others before him, but there was little doubt regarding the significance Douglas attached to Walker's 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world. Walker's appeal against slavery, Douglas said to his Washington, D.C. audience in 1883, quote, startled the land like a trump of coming judgment, end quote. Now, Douglas was not alone in holding this estimation of Walker. Others agreed. We can hear similar claims from Henry Highland Garnett, Maria Stewart, and, of course, Du Bois. And yet, like so many others that do not enjoy the prominence accorded Douglas or Du Bois in American philosophical letters, and even their prominence is tenuous, I think, Walker's place in African-American political thought has slowly slipped from view, maintained, dare I say, by only a handful of scholars. <laughs> and even then, the political philosophical significance of this single text has escaped even the most sophisticated among us. The reason for this underappreciation, I think, has much to do with the religious content at the heart of the pamphlet. Walker's text reads more like religious denunciations of blacks and whites, of voice, of fire and brimstone, rather than a philosophical treatise of critique and reconstruction, political reconstruction. Now, I'm not sure I like this distinction between religious um, denunciation and philosophical treatise, but it seems partly at work in preventing the esteem of Corded Walker by the likes of Douglas Stewart and Du Bois from extending into our own time. But if we place the religious character of Walker's text in its proper place. I suggest we will be better positioned to read him as a philosopher of freedom. Both in this lecture and the next, freedom will be our topic. This will be the longer of the two, I apologize. In this lecture, the use of freedom will appear a bit familiar, identified under the heading of what Walker calls Republican liberty even though the use to which he puts it will bear his mark. By the next lecture, Walker will be joined by others, and there we will see that their very deployment of Republican liberty involved them, that is, African-American intellectuals, in a conceptual reconfiguration. In saying this, I mean to get something out of the way very quickly. The ethical and political language of black Americans during this period, the 1820s to the 1850s, often followed that of their white counterparts, to be sure. But the normative vision of black folks sought to reshape the ethos of American society. The language of what we now call modernity functioned as a discursive field in common terms, democracy, equality, freedom, justice, domination, virtue, character worked as rhetorical devices within that field. The terms at once marked the familiar even as their reach were being transformed by political and intellectual actor, actors precluded from enjoying the benefits of modernity. This deployment of modernity's language by black people was a practical endeavor in the service of ethical and political improvement or what I shall otherwise refer to as perfectionism. In calling it perfectionism, I am merely taking my direction from novelist and social critic of a later period, Ralph Ellison. This is what Ellison writes. Actuated by passionate feats of revolutionary will, 
which released that dynamic power for moralizing both man and nature, instinct and society, which is a property of linguistic forms and symbolic actions. These principles, democracy, equality, individual freedom, and universal justice, now move us as articles of faith. Holding them sacred, we act or fail to act in their name. And in the free-willing fashion of words that are summoned up to name the ideal, they prod us ceaselessly toward the refinement and perfection of those formulations of policies and configurations of social forms of which they are signs and symbols. As we strive to conduct social action in accordance with the ideals they evoke, they in turn insist upon being made flesh. Perfectionism should not be understood as denoting some fixed place to which one is destined to arrive, <clears throat> but that is to give it a speculative meaning that does not match the tradition of African-American political thought. Rather, perfectionism is the ongoing development of self and society whose unfolding has empirical and historical anchors in the capacities of human beings and the social life they create. This fueled African-Americans' faith, at least for some, the ones I will attend to, that America could be a better polity. And so they redeployed the language of modernity, seeing in it signs and symbols of social forms and ways of living not yet made flesh. Now, few scholars doubt David Walker's reliance on God as the foundation of his defense of the freedom of blacks in America. It is difficult to bracket the place of God in his thinking and have a recognizable picture of a free society. <laughs> Excuse me. The religious content of the appeal is internally connected to our nature as human beings such that without the stipulation of God, liberty makes little sense. Walker relies on the proposition that we are created in the image of God as a reason for why our nature is constituted in the way that it is. We might think that the mere stipulation or the mere assertion of God's role in creating us as free creatures is enough to sustain Walker's arguments that blacks should be treated equally. Regardless of how blacks comport themselves in the face of domination, we might say that whites are obliged to abstain from practices of enslavement. Or to put the matter differently, the meaning and protection of freedom need not depend on our affirmation of it. If this were simply the case, there would be little reason for Walker to argue that it is ignorance that distorts the self-understanding of blacks or insists on the necessity of blacks acting in a way commensurate with the demand of freedom. And yet Walker does make these arguments. The reason for doing so is important. He means to underscore the importance of cooperation between God and humans and ultimately among themselves. Although the spirit and feeling, his words, not mine, of freedom that constitute humans cannot be erased, he is aware that his role in making us the creatures that we are does not mean we will always recognize the demand of our nature. Our nature, you see, is not self-executing. The spirit and feeling of freedom does not mean we will always comport ourselves in the light of it. This gap introduces interpretive space that the appeal means to fill. We must, as it were, assume a standpoint from which the meaning of human nature and in turn the force of freedom comes into view. This is why Walker insists throughout his text on the need to remove ignorance, and this explains his goal to awaken among his audience, quote, a spirit of inquiry and investigation, end quote. In emphasizing his quest to enlighten his reader, I do not mean to downplay the religious dimension of the appeal. I mean to put it in its proper place. For him, black Americans must resist the idea that just because God is foundational, they are relieved of their responsibility to address their unjust conditions. For him, the question of whether blacks are free human beings does not exclusively depend on the religious claim about human nature, although important, but on a normative view about oneself as a human being that Walker seeks to persuade his reader to adopt. African Americans must perform their freedom, he argues, 
in order to lay claim to it. This is what he means to awaken black Americans to the demandingness of freedom. Now this suggests that Walker has a rich notion of what counts as being free, his persistent attack on civility and ignorance throughout the appeal means to illuminate a form of enslavement that distorts the humanity of enslaved person. Not exclusively because individuals are treated as property, but also because of the narrowing effect it has on one's self-understanding. To free oneself from slavery is to move toward human flourishing. It is to resist domination. By domination, I mean the extent to which black Americans live at the arbitrary mercy or whim of their white counterparts, what Walker refers to as do classical and contemporary thinkers as the absence of Republican liberty. But domination radiates outward into the elusive social and cultural horizon of the community, subtly shaping and disciplining one's comportment, even in cases where there is no obvious master. The principal worry, at least in this context, relates to the effect of domination of African American self-understanding and the way it obscures the necessity of racial solidarity. As we will see in the next lecture, more needs to be done for Republican liberty to be, to be useful um, for African Americans during this period. Now, it is common to demand proper comportment from black Americans while losing sight of how white supremacy shapes, distorts, and destroys their lives. Walker is neither politically nor sociologically naive. He knows that the full realization of freedom does not solely depend on the actions of blacks, even if it is a condition for their freedom to acquire meaning in the world. Of course, he often has harsh things to say to his black audience regarding their civility and their willingness to set their goals based on the prescriptions of white Americans rather than on the reach of their own imaginations. Yet he levels some of his harshest criticisms against white Americans, both threatening a violent revolution and excoriating their moral hypocrisy for denying to blacks what the nation so vigorously fought to secure only a few decades earlier. For this reason, although the appeal is largely a document aimed at black folks, Walker also seeks to reclaim his words, not mine, whites by enlightening them regarding what they otherwise recognize in themselves, namely the demandingness of freedom. The appeal to use Danielle Allen's language is directed to the established etiquettes on display, the one of civility and the other of dominance with the aim of reorienting the habits of the audience. Today's lecture, the remaining lecture, unfolds in three parts. The first portion takes up Walker's invocation of God for understanding the relationship between nature and development. In other words, what does it mean to put the religious content in its proper place? That we are created in God's image highlights an affordance of our nature, but that claim only matters if we see and comport ourselves in the right way. I do not intend, as I said, to undermine the status of God in Walker's argument as much as I intend to show that it is one feature of a more complicated story. This sets the stage for Walker's educational or perfectionist intervention in the second part of the lecture. His argument about development allows for a careful elucidation of two examples to sit at the heart of Article 2 of the appeal of the complicit slave woman and the enslaved free man. When placed against the backdrop of Thomas Jefferson's demeaning claims about black Americans from his notes on the state of Virginia, the example centralized the importance of blacks acting as free individuals should. Importantly, Walker does not rely primarily on his religious argument about how we are created to motivate action. Rather, he means to persuade black Americans to inhabit a kind of identity that is commensurate with the nature he claims for them. And this, he believes, is a step toward human flourishing. The examples that he gives are negative illustrations or warning signs that attempt to capture the imagination of the audience to get them to see and feel appropriately regarding the lives on display. Walker means to use narrative to illuminate, narratives, excuse me, to illuminate what happens in the absence of adopting a particular normative attitude. Black Americans will become accessories to their own domination. 
the examples intended to serve an educational role that fill out the moral point of view of his audience. Finally, in the third part of the lecture, Walker completes the movement toward freedom of movement dependent on the comportment of white Americans. Whereas parts one and two stage a cooperative relationship between God and African Americans, and then again among themselves, section three takes up the comportment of whites toward blacks. His argument seeks to not only not only to induce fear, but to get them to seriously consider the shamefulness of their actions and the lack of ethical integrity those actions represent. Just as Walker seeks to capture his African-American audience regarding the meaning of their condition, he equally attempts to, attempts the same with his um, white American audience regarding their practice of, or practices of tyranny. In my view, the appeal is not exclusively about freedom for blacks and the moral depravity of whites. Walker's pamphlet is also an articulation of a religious anthropology of human nature, his vision of personhood, we might say. This description highlights an affordance of our nature, provided we adopt a standpoint from which the meaning of that nature is seen or comes into view. This utterance or this claim contains two points. The first, is a description of human nature that affords us a capacity for freedom. Affordance is not a term that readily comes to mind when we think of human nature, but consider it this way. A doorknob, to take a common example, affords us with an opportunity for twisting. The relationship is between an object and us. We can interpret human nature in a similar manner if we also treat our nature as an object of reflection. We do this all the time, when we think about what we take ourselves to be doing as the people we are and in the lives we lead. It should not be mysterious for us to think then that given the capacities we have as humans, our nature affords us with an opportunity for acting freely. Just as twisting is a function of a doorknob, so too we might say freedom is a function of our nature. I know I'm moving quickly. The second claim is an argument about occupying a perspective for understanding the meaning of that nature and in turn the capacity it affords us. Consider the doorknob once more. Twisting does not adhere in the knob itself. After all, if you remove it from the door, it may well be used as a weapon. The idea that the doorknob affords us with an opportunity for twisting makes sense only because we hold the possibility in view, we understand the relationship that connects the knob, the door, and ourselves. Similarly, human nature is a site of possibilities, and among them include the opportunity for freedom, provided we see our nature in its proper light. Here, we come to understand a specific kind of relationship that obtains between ourselves, the descriptions of ourselves, and the world in which we are located. When these two points are taken together, they capture the connection between our nature as free creatures and our epistemic development, that rightly holds that nature in view. Consider for a moment now a passage that appears <coughs> that appears in Article 4 of the Appeal, although the meaning is echoed in earlier articles. Quote, man is a peculiar creature. He is the image of his God, though he may be subjected to the most wretched condition upon earth. Yet the spirit and feeling which constitute the creature, man, can never be entirely erased from his breast because the God who made him after his own image planted it in his heart. He cannot get rid of it, end quote. The pain and suffering we endure as part of this world may be exacting, but it can never reach the substance of our nature. This too, Walker argues, applies to the reach of slavery and domination. But what constitutes the creature man? His answer is freedom. Quote, if we lay aside abject civility and be determined to act like men and not brutes, the murderers among the whites would be afraid to show their cruel heads, end quote. Walker contrasts abject civility, a characteristic suitable of a slave, to being a man. 
The latter is not merely meant as a descriptive term, i.e. what one finds in nature, but more importantly as a normative one, how we should understand humans. This normative picture of man explains why Walker is concerned about an important element of modern slavery, the goal to animalize black people. He takes up this point specifically in Article 1, Our Wretchedness and Consequence of Slavery, and repeats the point in Article 2, Our Wretchedness and Consequence of Ignorance. Whereas classical slavery, he contends, merely confined itself to the subordination of different peoples, it did not include, quote, insupportable insult upon the children of Israel by telling them they were not of the human family, end quote. Modern slavery, he maintains, differs on just this point. Quote, can the whites deny this charge? Have they not, after having reduced us to the deplorable condition of slaves under their feet, held us up as descending originally from the tribes of monkeys? End quote. Of course, slavery is an evil, but he is especially concerned with the additional claim that animalizes black Americans. Why is this so important? My apologies. Why is this so important? The answer has to do with the dehumanizing quality of slavery in its racialized form. Chattel slavery is an institution of exploitation as well as debasement, not only what Walker calls an insupportable insult, but what he says, or what he says elsewhere, a gross insult. The nature of debasement, Walker argues, disavows the ethical standing of persons by confounding their status with that of animals. As historian David Byron Davis notes, this carries a distinct meaning. It denotes, quote, eradication not of human identity, but of those elements of humanity that evoke respect and empathy and convey a sense of dignity, end quote. This is precisely the concerning aspect of chattel slavery to which Walker directs our attention. When one's status as a slave is accepted, whether reflectively or unreflectively, it has catastrophic ethical consequences. It narrows one's normative field of vision. Walker's focus is on how African Americans understand themselves given the description they come to accept and how acceptance of that description opens or closes possibilities. You might think there seems to be a problem with this account. On the one hand, humans have an unconquerable disposition or nature that is defined as free. These are walkers' terms. Yet on the other hand, this account seems to be flimsy since we might very well come to accept some other description of our nature, that we're monkeys. <clears throat> we are not instinctually drawn to take up one view rather than another. The issue at hand bears on the force of our nature. For our nature to be unconquerable, the language Walker uses in the appeal, it seems to lack the power that term implies. Now, I think one would be right to raise this concern, but I want to suggest that the flimsiness of our nature helps to centralize the importance of education and performance in Walker's thinking. Nature is only one part of what he means to illuminate. What I'm suggesting here is that this issue acknowledges the limits of our nature, and that limit points to a task, work to be done. As we will see, the work to be done highlights the importance of action that Walker calls for in the appeal. <laughs> but before we get there, we need to deal with this uh, weakness of our nature. Consider Walker's language from an earlier section of Article 2. Quote, Ignorance, my brethren, is a mist low down into the very dark and almost impenetrable abyss in which our fathers for many centuries have been plunged. End quote. Almost impenetrable. Well, let us return to the sentence quoted earlier, paying attention to his structure. Quote, man is a peculiar creature. He is the image of his God, though he may be subjected to the most wretched condition upon earth. Yet the spirit and feeling which constitute the creature man can never be entirely erased. 
The conjunction yet is meant to capture something taking place at the same time as when one says, the path was dark, yet I slowly found my way. Similarly, Walker does not mean to diminish the difficulty at work. His point is that despite that difficulty, there are limits to how far distortion and ignorance can go. The unconquerable disposition remains, but our understanding of our nature can be deformed because of slavery or hidden from view because of ignorance. The path back to our nature may be dark, but we may yet find our way. The appeal is a text seeking to inform the political and ethical activities of his readers and listeners so that they may find their way back. Now, I have been discussing the role of nature in Walker's thinking, but I want to be careful about how we finally understand its status. It should not be assumed that he derives the requirement of being or the requirements of being free from the description man independent of how we think and act with respect to that description. Man is not a value neutral term as he uses it. It's not this kind of thing that one simply finds in nature. The point is that the concept man is partly shaped by the normative description that is saddled with. Man is partly shaped by a normative description as being created as a free creature by God and cannot be understood once you remove that description. Remove the description and you may well have servile creatures, but not humans. The point comes into sharp relief if you keep in mind that Walker's pamphlet is a document that appeals to the judgment of the reader. He is exhorting African Americans to assume a specific normative point of view that he claims is their nature, a view that is meant to contrast with the description of them that is currently in circulation. I have no doubt that Walker believed God constituted humans as free creatures. But what holds philosophical significance here is that whether his religious anthropology is true is actually beside the point. What matters is that his audience believes it to be so. In Article 1, for instance, he emphatically asks, quote, Are we men, I ask you, O my brethren, are we men? This is not a rhetorical question, since he seemingly answers in Article 4, quote, But, O oh my God, in sorrow I must say it, that my color all over the world have a mean servile spirit, end quote. How is this possible? How can Walker concede that African Americans have a servile spirit in the very same paragraph where he asserts that a feeling and spirit of freedom constitute? Walker's use or uses of spirit in this context denote a vital principle or animating force, and yet his reflections denote contradictory principles, one of freedom and the other of civility. Here we confront the flimsiness of our nature once more. Is Walker confused? I propose that we resolve the confusion if we see that the mere fact that God constituted us as free is of little consequence by itself. For he agrees with William James's later remark, quote, our only way, for example, of doubting or refusing to believe that a certain thing is, is continuing to act as if it were not, end quote. For Walker, the only way of doubting or refusing to believe that we as African Americans are men, to use his language, is to continue to act as if we were not. And so Walker says, recalling the line just quoted above, be determined to act like men. Since the subject man cannot be separated from the normative status of being free, accepting that one is a man, for him, performatively entails its own truth. This is why he is so concerned about the descriptions we accept of ourselves. For the descriptions shall be true just to the extent African Americans performatively affirm them. Walker's emphasis on performativity, on action, constitutes his response to Jefferson's demeaning views of blacks rather than a direct argumentative refutation. Jefferson's claims in query 14 of his 1787 notes on the state of Virginia <coughs> engage in what is taken at the time as a scientific analysis regarding the physical, intellectual, and moral endowments of African Americans. Even if Jefferson did not place blacks outside the human family, he nonetheless viewed, he nonetheless viewed them as distinct within it, contributing to the perceived bestial nature of black people. For him, 
the inner workings of blacks are taken to be determinative of their outer comportment, it is then possible to speak, as others did, about specific black individuals, their character and mental endowments by virtue of the larger racial classification to which they belong. The classification becomes shorthand for making ethical judgments about particular black persons. Jefferson thus concludes his reflections with an important claim that Walker cites, quote, this unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people, end quote. Because someone of Jefferson's status backs the claim, Walker rightly perceives it, regardless of what Jefferson says or intended elsewhere, as, ca as causing harm to the status of freedom. He remarked, quote, Mr. Jefferson has in truth injured us more and has been as great a barrier to our emancipation as anything that has ever been advanced against us, end quote. Walker does not respond to Jefferson's argument by offering a contrary scientific analysis focused on the inner life of whites. Rather, he reverses the mode of inquiry treating activity, the outer performance of blacks, as indicative of their nature. Quote, I am glad, he writes. Mr. Jefferson has advanced his position for your sake, for you will either have to contradict or confirm him by your own actions, end quote. The emphasis on performance or action is not meant to throw out Walker's religious anthropology. That anthrop anthropology does work in two important respects. First, it allows him to argue that, quote, God made man to serve him alone and that man should have no other lord or lords but himself, that God Almighty is the sole proprietor or master of the whole human family and will not on any consideration admit of a colleague, end quote. The claim, not unlike John Locke's in the Second Treatise of Government, is that because we each belong to God, we are each protected from being the property of another. Those who abandon their freedom or deny freedom to others invite God's wrath. The claim was of some significance, prompting abolitionist Henry Highland Garnett to remark in 1843, quote, the forlorn condition in which blacks are placed does not destroy their moral obligation to God, end quote. Second, and again similar to Locke and echoed by Garnett, Walker is clear that although the source of our freedom may well be owed to God, the custodianship of that freedom rests with us. This last point prepares the way for Walker's question, what does it mean to do right by our nature? Whatever the answer is to that question, which we will take up in a moment, his point is that what follows from the standpoint of our nature is currently not in view because of slavery and ignorance. As he has been saying, the habits of dominance and civility obscure the affordance of human nature to which African Americans must be awakened, and it is to this issue we must now turn. For Walker, our nature is of little significance apart from a normative attitude that is commensurate with it, an attitude expressed in performance. Hence he says, quote, it is not to be understood here that I mean for us to wait until God shall take us by the hair of our heads and drag us out of abject wretchedness and slavery, end quote. To adopt a normative attitude denotes Walker's goal to get African Americans to exercise the capacity for freedom, and in that moment they will have become the picture of their nature he describes. The first step in doing so is to see what happens in the absence of assuming such a standpoint. The thrust of his approach turns on two of the examples central to Article 2 of his appeal, the complicit slave woman and the enslaved free man. Apart from the examples illuminating or elucidating what black life looks like in the absence of freedom, it is worth reflecting for a moment on the fact that Walker relies on stories to enrich the judgment of his audience. The examples do not merely describe, they appeal to readers and listeners asking them to judge the situations. Judgment here has a cognitive affective character to it that literally intends to move the audience. I want to first say a word about this process of enriching judgment that will in turn prepare the way for his examples. My use of standpoint relates to Walker's uh, folk moral psychology, we might call it. The use of folk denotes his commonsensical approach. His moral psychology does not depend on controversial assumptions, at least to his 19th century audience, about forming moral judgments. This informs his approach to freedom. 
Although one can advance an affirmative argument for freedom, one can also, as Walker does, defend freedom from the perspective of negation. Here, Walker paints a picture of lives and experiences in which docility and domination are the operating norms. Do these lives, Walker might be read as asking, not appear morally impoverished to you. He intends to metaphorically place the audience in conversation with perspectives that may not readily be considered storytelling, the kind one often finds in African-American letters in which racial domination functions to obstruct human flourishing, is a tool for focusing the audience's perception to get them to see and feel in a certain way in the light of those stories. Consider Walker's words, quote, any man who is curious to see the full force of ignorance developed among the colored people of the United States of America, has only to go into the southern and western states of this confederacy where, if he is not a tyrant, but has the feelings of a human being who can feel for a fellow creature, he may see enough to make his very heart bleed." End quote. This passage conveys the complex interaction between Walker's commitment to democratic republicanism and sentimentalism. First, by centralizing the master-slave image in his analysis to illuminate the meaning of freedom. Second, by placing affect in a productive relationship to one's self-understanding as a human being responsive to the claims of one's fellows. Walker means to use the imagination as both a vehicle and productive agent of phenomenological knowledge. Let me take each of these points, the master-slave, and the sort of status of affect. Let me take each one of these points in turn. In the passage, Walker has in mind a common idea of the master-slave relationship uh, so it's central to democratic republicanism's idea of freedom. Just as he defines a human being in contrast to a slave, he also contrasts being a human to a tyrant. To be a human being is to occupy a position in between these two extremes, the slave who lives at the mercy of another and the tyrant who lives only to dominate others. This in-between position is the standpoint of what Walker calls Republican liberty, understood as the absence of arbitrary power. He means to relocate his audience to that position by showing them what happens when freedom goes unrealized. Second, the lines occur in the sixth paragraph of Article 2 of the Appeal and form part of what we might call the introduction to that article. In that introduction, Walker is trying to orient his reader, who he explicitly refers to on three occasions in that paragraph as my observer or observer. In his Latin formulation, to observe is to watch over, to note, to heed. It's no wonder the word observer was regularly used as part of newspaper titles indicating that one should take note and heed what is contained therein. When Walker remarks then that one's standpoint is enriched if they, quote, go into southern and western states, a formulation he will repeat, he does not simply mean to provide direction. But he is also telling us something about his own approach. His vision of traveling seeks to expand the imagination of the audience and thereby inform their judgments. The position of the observer for Walker is not, is not inert. For as he says in the preamble, quote, I shall endeavor to penetrate, search out, and lay our miseries open for your inspection, end quote. Now this way of speaking fits with what he means to observe. To properly inspect requires that one, quote, lay aside prejudice long enough to view candidly and impartially, end quote. He has in mind not only white Americans who benefit from dominating black Americans, but also those black Americans who are either, quote, in league with tyrants or who are said to be free because they are subjected to the horrors of, because they are not subjected to the horrors of slavery in the South. These last two positions, the ones who are in league or those who believe they are not subjected to the horrors of slavery in the South, maybe because they're in the North, correspond to the two examples central to Article 2. Walker's language of candid and impartial endeavors to remove bias and prejudice that would close the observer off from what is on display. He therefore wants Black Americans, especially those in the Northeast, to be clear about A, the conditions of blacks in the South and West, and B, the evaluative structure of the society in which those conditions emerge. 
Blacks in the Northeast may well avoid the first, but they cannot avoid the second because, as Walker makes clear, the evaluative structure is informed by a racial classification system to which they, too, are subjected. To be impartial, then, is to be fully alive to the world in which one is located. He knows we cannot abandon the position we occupy, but he hopes the force of our position can be lessened long enough so that we may imagine the position of our fellows and, as a result, come to understand our own position. This theme of imagining is also at work in the contrast he draws between having the feelings of a human being and having the feelings of a tyrant. His point is that the character of the tyrant is defined by being inattentive and insensitive to the pain of others. The tyrant tracks only his own concerns, interests, and feelings. From the perspective of the tyrant's actions and judgments, the world seems strikingly unoccupied by anyone who might make a claim worthy of a response. The world may well include others, but it most certainly isn't shared or held in common. In contrast, Walker seems to be saying that A, to be a human being is to have what we might call a shared physiology, a feeling that we as humans recognize, and B, unless we are somehow emotionally broken or unable to lay aside our prejudices for a moment, we readily feel for our fellows. For Walker, the audience is able to, quote, see the full force of ignorance and have their, quote, heart bleed because they are shaped by attentiveness to the lives of others. To have the feelings of a human being then seem to readily carry with it a presumption of a shared community that can be brought into view for our fellows. But why go on? Why refer to the importance of feeling for a fellow creature in the context of habits of civility and domination, in the context of slavery? His point is that if the audience feels appropriately for their fellows, this will cause them emotional pain. As he says, right, it may... Or he may see enough to make his very heart bleed. Feeling as Walker is using the term involves sensations of physiological disturbances captured metaphorically in the bleeding heart. This is brought on by a set of experiences that he believes a candid and impartial audience would readily disapprove of. This is why it seems appropriate to call this folk moral psychology. There is something strikingly ordinary about what Walker has in mind. After remarking that he may see enough to make his very heart bleed, he briefly specifies what experiences would generate such pain. Listen to this passage carefully. Referring to the observer, he may see there a son take his mother, who bore almost the pains of death to give him birth, and by the command of a tyrant, strip her as naked as she came into the world and apply the cowhide to her until she falls a victim to death in the road. He may see a husband take his dear wife, not unfrequently in a pregnant state, and perhaps far advanced, and beat her for an unmerciful wretch, and until his infant falls a lifeless lump at her feet. My observer may see fathers beating their sons, mothers, their daughters, and children, their parents, all to pacify the passions of unrelenting tyrants. He presents these examples because he believes they tap into a proper alignment between experience and our affective judgments about them, our affective judgments of them, that is part of the social world. Consider the thrust of the passage. Walker is not merely saying some random person stripped some random woman on command by some random individual and proceeded to beat her. While this may very well be abhorrent, he wants to direct our attention to son, mother, and the commandment of the tyrant, for it is by virtue of those relationships that the emotions we feel take on the texture that they do. The entailments of these roles, as Walker understand them, are otherwise distorted or more significantly go unrealized or in principally to the scene in which they are located, a scene of enslavement and domination. Citing these relationships is meant to focus attention on the example so that the texture of cruelty is properly perceived. These relationships, in other words, function as causes for why one should be horrified by the violation of what those, vi what those relationships demand. They have explanatory and normative power. Walker thus invoke, invokes these 
examples because they contain within them standards that the constitutive of social life reflect shared concerns and that capture what members of society care about. Walker's emphasis on physiological disturbances, his use of the word pain, does not exhaust his meaning. As suggested by previous remarks, feeling is about something for Walker, judgment about the world and the lives on display. <clears throat> Since he has more in mind than sensation, one wishes Walker would have specified the relevant emotions. Does he mean anger, indignation, sadness, sympathy, or something else? Or does he mean the word feeling to serve as the bundle term for what are otherwise specific emotions? This perhaps is to demand too much of Walker's pamphlet and to be too little aware of how the idiom typically functions. To say my heart bleeds for you is to express sadness and sympathy at once. Although Walker does not specify these emotions, it seems clear that it that he has in mind is structured sensitivity to the world that involves an appraisal. And one thing we can say for certain is that a bleeding heart is not a good thing for the person whose heart it is and the individuals to which sympathy and sadness are directed. In deploying stories as he does, Walker's analysis of affective judgment moves in two different directions. To appropriate the language of one scholar, Walker's reflections contain both mind-to-world and world-to-mind relationships. The first of these is seeking to get into right relationship with the world, understood as appropriately, as appropriately perceived in the cruelty on display. Hence, if one has the feelings of a human being and not a tyrant, one's heart cannot help but bleed because that is the appropriate response given the situation. But to feel appropriately is simultaneously to wish that those cruel experiences were not or were no longer part of the social and political order to which one belongs. Affective judgment is not merely about adjusting one's mind to the world, but it expresses a longing that the world would adjust itself to the aspirations of one's mind. And with these remarks, Walker has really primed his audience for the two stories. Walker transitions from his introductory remarks to, quote, show the force of degraded ignorance and deceit among black Americans. He refers to an article of 1829 from the Columbian Sentinel, a prominent Boston, Massachusetts newspaper that recounts the details of 60 slaves, some of whom managed to get free in Kentucky while being transported from Maryland to the Mississippi. Those responsible for the slaves included Gordon, a Negro driver, and his two companions. Although Walker transcribes the entire article, it's worth looking at a small selection. <clears throat> the men were handcuffed and chained together in the usual manner for driving those poor wretches, while the women and children were suffered to proceed without encumbrance. It appears that by means of a file, the Negroes unobserved has succeeded in separating the iron which bound their hands in such a way as to be able to throw them off at any moment. At this moment, every Negro was found to be perfectly at liberty, and one of them, seizing a club, gave one of the companions a violent blow on the head and laid him dead at his feet, and the other, who came to his assistance, met a similar fate. Gordon was then attacked, seized and held by one of the Negroes, while another fired twice at him with a pistol, the ball of which each time grazed his head but not provide an effectual. He was beaten with clubs and left for dead. Gordon, not being materially injured, was enabled by the assistance of one of the women to mount his horse and flee." End quote. After quoting the article, Walker writes, quote, I want you to notice particularly in, this, in the article above the ignorant and deceitful actions of this colored woman, I beg you view it candidly. What do you think of this? End quote. His query is sincere, but he provides some guidance in assessing the situation. Although Walker goes on to discuss the actions of the black men, also mentioned in the newspaper article, it is a black woman to which he first directs the attention of the observer. His point is that the black is that the black woman also has fallen prey to ignorance, implicating her in her own domination and domination of those similarly situated. When Walker refers to the woman as ignorant, he is referring to the fact that she is unaware of what the situation demands. 
We might liken the situation, to borrow a modern example, to a blind spot, an area just outside of a driver's visual field. Analogously, the woman displays the normative attitude of a slave leading to a moral blind spot. As Walker says, despite the freedom that the context creates, the servile woman nonetheless assists Gordon's, Gordon as if she were not in a state of perfect liberty, although Walker calls it a state of perfect liberty. But the observer is also meant to bear witness to something else having to do with the relationship of the other slaves to the woman. There was no good reason for the men to believe that one who was equally enslaved would act in a way to aid the enslaver. This is why the actions are considered deceitful. They deceive those who rightly expect her actions, given the context, to be otherwise. What is the observer to make of all of this? The woman is caught in a double bind. She is bound by an expectation she does not see and therefore bound by a betrayal she does not acknowledge. An individual so caught becomes a co-participant in their own domination without being aware and the domination of others without recognizing them. But it may seem odd that Walker shuffles in blame, labeling as he does her actions deceitful. Difficult as it may be to note, he is very much concerned to distinguish between making a normative judgment about the woman's actions and making a normative judgment about her capacity for freedom. Her actions are out of step with what it means to be a free human being, and this is because she lives under the weight of slavery. This need not mean that she is unable to recognize the offense against freedom that her actions represent. For the moment, the observer should note the self-deception and betrayal on display, but should not, or should also judge rather, the position of the woman terribly tragic given the habits of dominance and civility that narrowed her field of vision. Despite the woman's position, Walker refuses to extend pity to her or encourage it by others. In fact, he tells his audience, quote, the actions of this black woman are really insupportable, end quote. Here again, the target turns out to be our actions. The rationale is not as callous as it may first appear. As he says, one who, quote, will stand still and let another murder him is worse than an infidel, and if he has common sense, ought not to be pitied, end quote. Pity is often extended to those who condition, although unfortunate, can never be like our own. It looks downward on the condition of others, often smuggling in condescension toward the suffering person and affirming feelings of deserved advantage in oneself. When applied to this context, it takes on a specific meaning. To pity the woman is to pity the absence of common sense, and this is precisely what Walker rejects. Such a position may reinforce the view of blacks often used to challenge their equal standing. The term common sense and the related formulations that appear throughout the appeal, such as sense, sound sense, and good sense, is not usual or unusual Excuse me, in the 19th century. You can find the use of these terms among the the American revolutionary generation, as well as African-American abolitionists with varying political programs such as Daniel Coker, Robert Purvis, and William Whipper. Common sense means for Walker, as it did for many, an ordinary way of seeing things about which there is no need for debate and to which we all have access. The epistemological significance of this term extends to political life precisely because of its social leveling implications, the belief that regardless of our station in life, we are all endowed with a basic and equal capacity for understanding and assessing the world around us. There is something odd at work when common sense is mentioned, as we see in Walker's text. As Sophia Rosenfeld rightly points out of the term, what generally no one invokes, quote, common sense who is not convinced that it is under soul or fast disappearing, end quote. Walker is no different. He mentions the capacity precisely to deny the claim currently in circulation that black Americans are without it. Paradoxically, he discourages pity in order to affirm the equal access by the black woman and those like her to common sense. His argument is undoubtedly directed to his listening and reading public, and his upshot should not be understated. Despite the view of African Americans in circulation, he contends common sense belongs to black women and men alike, and therefore is not the sole property of whites. The point you should have figured out by now, I hope, is less about the woman described in the story and is more about the reader and the listener of the appeal. After all, she is a stand-in for Walker's audience and embodied identity through which the effects and affects of civilian dominance are discernible. 
and as such he means to disrupt the logic of these forms of comportment. For him, so long as black, black Americans, men and women alike, think of themselves as unresponsive to the injury of racial domination because they lack common sense, the more they must see whatever limitations they have, even when brought on by the institutions of slavery and practices of domination as limitations for which they cannot be held partially responsible and from which they cannot be freed. For Walker, this concedes too much ground. It invites the claim that blacks are incapable of acting as free humans should and therefore are rightly treated as unequals. This rejects what our nature affords us as human beings, a capacity for freedom and therefore a capacity to recognize when that freedom has gone unrealized. We have now arrived at a four-part lesson for the observers. The observers should see the self-deception and betrayal on display in the example. The observers should judge the position of the woman terribly tragic given the habits of dominance and civility responsible for her condition. The observers should nonetheless judge her and those like her undeserving of pity precisely because of the capacity of transformation that is the basic and equal capacity to reflectively align one's actions with the demand of freedom the demand that freedom makes. What finally does this mean for the position of the observers? Although this appropriate alignment may well be too late for the black woman, it need not be too late for those who have now witnessed what civility and domination have created. After leaving the example of the complicit slave woman, stay with me, Walker turns his attention to the enslaved free man. This example shows how racial domination radiates outward, influencing the standards black Americans set for themselves. But it is also here that Walker asserts the necessity of racial solidarity in response to racialized domination. Walker's treatment of racial domination points to the constraints on those blacks that are putatively free. He means to illuminate the way racial domination infiltrates the very self-understanding of black Americans. Consider the following example of what I call the enslaved free man. Quote, I met a colored man in the street a short time since with a string of boots on his shoulder. We fell into conversation in the course of which I said to him, what a miserable set of people we are, he asked. Why? I said, I, we are so subjected under the whites that we cannot obtain the comforts of life, but by cleaning their boots and shoes, old clothes, waiting on them, shaving them, etc., said he. With the boots on his shoulders, I am completely happy. I never want to live any better or happier than when I can get plenty of boots and shoes to clean? Oh, how can those who are actuated by avarice only but think that our Creator made us to be an inheritance to them forever when they see that our greatest glory is centered in such mean and low objects?" End quote. There are two arguments here, the last of which will lead to a third. The first is captured by the last sentence. Precisely because the man is only concerned with monetary gain, Walker argues he is unaware of the evaluative structure in which his status as a boot black is located. This directs us to the second argument relating to the force of racial domination, the way it constrains and conditions one's self-description. The second point underscores how racial domination limits even where there is no obvious person acting in the role of a master. This should bring to mind the example of the complicit slave woman who is in the condition of perfect liberty but nonetheless runs to the aid of her enslaver. This leads to the third point not referenced in the passage regarding Walker's assertion of the necessity of racial solidarity. Walker does not have an aversion to labor that helps provide for one's family and basic subsistence. What he does object to is setting one's sights no higher than cleaning and shining the shoes of white folks, quote, for if we are men, he explains, we ought to thank, be thankful of the, uh, be thankful to the Lord for the past and for the future, be looking forward with thankful hearts to higher attainments than wielding the razor and cleaning boots and shining shoes, end quote. Walker's language is part of it, part and parcel of the complicated politics of racial uplift or respectability politics common among Northeastern black intellectuals. At a minimum, Uplift ideology is a way of talking about political, spiritual, and economic autonomy, what Erica Ball refers to as the, quote, intrinsic value of respectability. As a result, he thinks there is more to life than shining shoes and shaving faces. Two observations should be noted. First, 
Walker's uplift ideology must be appropriately contextualized. His deeper concern is with a class of persons, blacks, that are structurally confined to occupy specific jobs in order to serve yet another class of persons, whites. When he argues that black Americans are not an inheritance to whites, which he um, does in the passage above, he does so in order to upset the link between America's development market economy and white supremacy. The most intense form of this connection, Walker says, is in having us, quote, work without remunerations for our services. May I not ask, he queries, to fatten the wretch and his family, end quote. On the one side, then, Walker's criticism of the boot black might well appear complicitous with the dominant descriptions of blacks because of the ease with which it marks this man is comfortable with his position. And yet on the other side, it subverts such descriptions by calling into question the genuineness of the man's freedom. Uplift ideology or respectability politics was a way to highlight the transformative power of freedom, quote, its ability to remake an individual into new into a new being elevated to a higher state, end quote, that was not itself determined by the standards of white Americans. That the boot black is actuated by avarice only serves to obscure the limits that have been placed on his aspirations and in turn the structural inequality in which he participates that is fundamentally shaped by white supremacy. The black man confuses the fact that he cleans shoes because he has no choice with the fact or with the idea that he cleans shoes because he has freely chosen that profession. The boot black's aspirations are unwittingly tethered to the constrained expectations that are generally set for blacks in America, namely that they are meant to serve precisely because their lives are worth less than their white counterparts. Walker's point is that black Americans are perceived as only useful for work of this kind and that acceptance of this view, blacks, quote, glorying and being happy in such low employments, end quote, merely reaffirms their unequal and unfree standing. The evaluative structure that deems blacks inferior and that is responsible for southern and western enslavement thus radiates outward influence in one's own self-description. Second, one might think that Walker's conception of freedom places an inordinate demand on black Americans, undercutting the ability to isolate those moments of liberty, however slight, under conditions of domination. In this context, one might Think of Frederick Douglass's final passage of his 1845 autobiography, where he describes both feeling like a slave and yet feeling, quote, a degree of freedom while speaking at an anti-slavery convention in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Walker's analysis seems not to admit of such gradations that might explain the reaction of the boot black to a situation, but this is to miss the crucial distinction at work in this comparison. Unlike the boot black, Douglas is well aware that he enjoys the most superficial aspects of freedom. This is precisely why Douglas says, following the line above, quote, from that time until now, I have been engaged in pleading the cause of my brethren. What is striking about the boot black is that he believes his situation exhausts what freedom means and what it makes possible. By virtue of this belief, he ironically participates in his own domination. This much Walker says to his audience, you may therefore go to work, and do, do what you can to rescue, or join in with the tyrants, end quote. This moves us to his last point. What then is demanded of the boot black and those, those like him? What should the observer make of all of this? Walker's response to those who are putatively free, like Douglas's response, is precisely what he thinks one should rightly expect from the complicit slave woman, that is to ally with those similarly situated. Speaking of the boot black, Walker says to his audience, I advance it therefore to you not as a problematical, but as an unshaken and forever immovable fact, that your full glory and happiness, as well as all other colored people under the heaven, shall never be fully consummated, but with the entire emancipation of your enslaved brethren all over the world, end quote. This is a clarion call for solidarity as a fundamental element in securing black liberation. We have come to the hour mark. I'm obviously over time but I ask that you just stay a little longer as we get through this last leg. We have now moved from discussing the relationship between God and African Americans to the necessity of acting as freedom demands. There's some final questions to be asked. Given the intensity of domination that Walker describes, why should we read the appeal as a pamphlet that also seeks to transform white Americans? Answering this question requires us to address the complex themes of fear, shame, and integrity and how Walker intends for them 
to function in his appeal. To get a handle on this, we should begin by comparing the appeal to another revolutionary document, a document that Walker references, the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> The latter document is very clear that the colonists sought to divorce from Great Britain its king and British subject, subjects. We see a transition from members belonging to colonies, having allegiance to a superior power, to becoming free and independent states. The document indicates that the character of the king provides no good reason to believe that he will act in a way commensurate with the character of a free people. Similarly, Walker regularly speaks about the tyrannical actions of whites, and even refers to them at one point as the, quote, natural enemies of blacks. This ostensible correspondence between Walker's appeal and the Declaration seems to imply the inability of whites to be transformed, and one would think it would lead to a final conclusion. Divorce. Comparatively speaking, despite the similarities between his pamphlet and the Declaration, the appeal is a different text. Even as Walker pushes for solidarity, he does not mean for blacks to take up a separate and equal station among the white powers of the earth. <clears throat> in this regard, he does not sound the alarm of separation in the way Martin Delaney would come to do in the 1850s, but rather recommits to the idea that the polity also belongs to African Americans. The final call of the pamphlet does not mirror the Declaration in its conclusion. Despite the fact that the appeal concludes with embracing the revolutionary tone of the Declaration, Walker's insurrectionist argument should be understood within an if-then propositional framework, that is, if white Americans don't transform, then black Americans will rebel. He has not abandoned faith even as he struggles to embrace it, that white Americans may yet transform. There is, after all, a differential appeal at the heart of the pamphlet. Walker's target is not only the docility of blacks, but also the domineering or tyrannical actions of whites. His, earlier, his early appeal to the observer marks this distinction. Quote, he may see some of my brethren in league with tyrants. There is a clear division between the he that stands apart from members of my or Walker's brethren. The aim is not only for blacks to see the practice of slavery and white supremacy, but also for whites to ethically consider the tyranny with which they may bear witness or commit. Walker's first purpose is to say to white Americans that tyranny only serves to prepare black Americans for a violent revolution. Quote, they have newspapers and monthly periodicals, he writes in Article 3, and the reader scarcely finds a paragraph respecting slavery, and which will be the final overthrow of its government unless something is very speedily done, for their cup is nearly full. End quote. Cited in the Declaration in Article 4, he reminds white Americans of their justification for a revolution. Quote, hear your language further, but when a long train of abuses and use of patience pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. End quote. Walker wants his white audience to understand that insofar as freedom is as central to human existence as they claim, the logical conclusion, given racial domination, can only be a violent exchange between themselves and blacks. What is striking about Walker's use of the Declaration is what he leaves out. That the Declaration outlines the justification for revolution, understand his long train of abuses and use of patience, is not yet to declare a break with Great Britain. This comes in a line or in the lines that follow the portion above, which Walker does not cite, quote, such has been the, the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. The declaration is clear. The colonists mean to announce what they have already done. In contrast, Walker speaks differently. The lines above that I just cited do not appear in the appeal after citing the justification for revolution, he writes, quote, Some of you no doubt believe that we will never throw off your murderous government and provide new guards for our future security. He says again in a, few, in, in a footnote, The Lord has not taught the Americans that we will not someday or other throw off their chains and handcuffs, end quote. Using the possibility to induce fear, or well, the possibility, excuse me, using the possibility of revolution to induce fear is meant to focus attention on the present 
and one's actions therein that may yet prevent an imaginable future from coming to fruition. Fear seems to stand in a productive relationship to our reasoning capacities. Walker is not the first to understand fear in justice way. Fear was given to us, says Locke, as a monitor to quicken our industry, the most significant defender of of the role of fear in informing our judgment is obviously Thomas Hobbes. It leads, he says, to articles of peace upon which men may be drawn to agreement. This theme also figures prominently among African-American thinkers and activists that followed Walker. It was at work in Douglas, Harriet Tubman, Du Bois, Malcolm X, and even, Mount, and even Martin Luther King Jr. What African-American theorists share with Walker is the idea that fear can clear the ground of factors that entices white Americans to stand idly by in the face of racial domination or to engage in the practice themselves. It does this by treating self-preservation as a necessary, even if insufficient, condition for enjoying the goods life provides. The urgency with which he argues for the eventual coming of violence, an urgency that cuts through all four articles of the appeal, is meant to heighten the place of fear in the minds of its readers and open them to what may address it. The function of fear is not merely self-referential. It, uh, it directs one's attention to the condition and subjectivity of black Americans, in part by tapping white Americans' sense of self-worth. There is danger here, for it may well be the case that black Americans are reduced to wild animals to be put down, returning the reader back to the tendency of white supremacy to animalize those over whom it exacts its greatest harms. It is most certainly the case that fear prompted legislative bodies in the South to ban documents they considered incendiary. And Jefferson's own sense that blacks and whites were located in a Hobbesian state of war most certainly fueled his desire to free blacks and place them beyond the reach of the United States. But these interpretations are too narrow a construal of, of how Walker understands fear. For him, it may yet serve a ground clearing or as a ground clearing device. As one, as one white reader, previously skeptical of the truth of the appeal, observed, quote, let those who hold him such that is incendiary, ruffian, or exciter of sedition imagine the circumstances of the two classes of our people reversed, and those who now rise up and call him curse will build him a monument and cry Hosiana to the patriot, the herald of freedom, end quote. Another possible outcome, but only a possibility, is that the complex subjectivity of black Americans and the desire for freedom comes into sharp relief. Fear focuses one's attention on the primary, on the primacy of freedom that now goes unrealized because of tyranny. On this reading, the likelihood of violent rebellion comes not from wild beasts unaware of their place, but from political agents demanding to be treated accordingly. In directing the attention of the reader to the present moment, we can explain the second way Walker deploys his criticism of tyranny. This takes us to Walker's perspective. Uh, to what Walker perceives as the promise at the core of the Declaration that has gone and realized. Importantly, this promise is the basis for reconstituting the American polity. Reconstituting society depends on the extent to which the audience feels the pull of their ethical failure and the demand that honor and freedom makes on them. Feeling the pull and demand of one's ethical failures and commitments is precisely the rhetorical register on which Walker argues. In the appeal, ethical disapprobation is about the character of the audience, one that is intimately connected to affect. Here, Walker seeks to shame the reader into action. If fear works to discipline one's reflective attention, shame represents an affective judgment regarding the ethical gap between one's settled beliefs and practices. Affective judgment sounds odd to our contemporary ears only if we think our emotions are without cognitive content. Walker does not think in these terms. As he says in the passage from Article 2 that I cited earlier, if he is not a tyrant but has the feelings of a human being who can feel for a fellow creature, he may see enough to make his very heart bleed. The metaphoric use of the bleeding heart turns out to denote an affective judgment of value regarding what one is witnessing. The reason for why one ought to be fearful sends white Americans back to their ethical failure. The standard against which that failure comes into view is the declaration, and this anchors the deployment of shame. But the deployment of the declaration involves an important revision that, that dethrones its primary author, Thomas Jefferson, 
Throughout the appeal, we have seen Walker's attack again and again on Jefferson's thinking, his words, and his practices. When Walker invokes the Declaration as the ethical foundation of the polity, but refuses to encourage black immigration, he revises the function of the document to include African Americans as its heirs on American soil. And so far as the legacy of Jefferson has followed, the polity will be tarnished because one's actions will stand in violation of the Declaration's meaning, and this must be the source of profound shame. Shame is an uncertain but nonetheless important emotion. It involves falling below standards to which one otherwise take oneself to be committed. This internal logic points to his uncertainty. Walker must take as settled the unrealized values of those to whom he appeals, and yet it is those, it is the actions of white Americans that suggest they are not committed to those values at all. Walker locates himself squarely within this uncertain arena. He asks in Article 4, do you understand your own language? Hear your language proclaimed to the world July 4th. And he utters the famous lines from the Declaration. He then invites his white audience to compare, his, to compare the language of the Declaration to the factual treatment of black Americans. Quote, compare your own language above, extracted from your Declaration of Independence with your cruelties and murderers inflicted by your cruel and unmerciful fathers and yourselves on our, on our fathers and on us. This comparative moment, as much as it highlights the uncertainty of shame for Walker, it also marks the importance of the emotion, for the comparison is seeking to generate ethical dissonance given the words of the Declaration. This is the moment of possibilities not yet realized, a world in which deeds and actions may rightly correspond. We should take note of his approach, Walker is not naive regarding the singular truth of moral persuasion and its relationship to politics. Quote, as David Bromwich puts it, that injustice you aim to correct had better be seen not from the point of view of the victim, but from the perspective of the agent who commits the injustice. This may be the most difficult line of this lecture to swallow. One comes face to face, as David Bromwich remarks, with, quote, some contrast between what I am and what I ought to be that startles me and leads to self-discontent, which then issues in remedy or redress." End quote. The force of ethical dissonance cannot be disentangled from his companion character trait integrity. Integrity is not merely about an internal ethical uprightness, but the way that internal wholeness displays itself in conduct. Treating black folks as you do, Walker says to his audience, makes you untrue to yourself and for that one ought to be ashamed. The proper treatment, to borrow from one scholar, that you extend or do not extend to black Americans says, says something about them to be sure, but it does so only after it has said something about you. For in withholding freedom and equality from them, you at once fail to confirm the place of these commitments in your own life. To take seriously one's own language as expressed in the Declaration must reject the differential application of its values as they are currently practiced. An immediate and difficult question emerges. How can shame function in a context of intense racial domination? Given the structure of shame, the use of it as a technique may seem poorly suited for the practices of slavery and domination at work. Surely we might say Walker is underestimating the deep-seated nature of white supremacy that doesn't merely blunt the force of equality and liberty, but transforms the meaning of these terms altogether. For if the logic of white supremacy devalues black life, the differential application of equality and liberty makes perfect sense. The invocation of shame and integrity are pointless because there is no gap between ideals and practices. And we know that many white Americans did not see the domination of blacks as inconsistent with the commitment to equality and liberty. What Walker is after may very well seem impossible. Walker might respond to this by relying on the very agency in both whites and blacks he means to guide and inform. In fact, he expresses it in a preamble to the appeal. Quote, the sources from which our misery are derived and on which I shall comment, I shall not combine in one, but shall put them under distinct heads and expose them in their turn, in doing which, keeping truth on my side, not departing from the stricter rules of morality, I shall endeavor to penetrate, search out, and lay them open for your inspection. 
If you cannot or will not profit by them, I shall have done my duty to you, my country, and my God. End quote. Walker's use of the word inspection makes clear that he believes blacks and whites may yet learn something about their condition. The very structure of the appeal attempts to establish the condition for its proper reception. But this mundane point also presupposes that despite the habits of civility and dominance that police the relationship between blacks and whites, those habits need not run so deep as to make one immune to appeals for transformation. I have largely explored Walker's deployment of what he calls Republican liberty as a ready-made concept for criticizing both the comportment of blacks and whites. This will be my last point. But this obscures how the very deployment of freedom by African-American intellectuals and activists during this period involved them in trying to properly calibrate the usefulness of Republicanism to the demands of racial or racialized domination. For Walker, but others as well, such as Oziah Easton, Martin Delaney, and Frederick Douglass, just to name a few, responding to racialized domination marked a unique challenge when compared to the political domination that fellows face against the British crown. Unlike for the latter, the American colonists, constitutional rearrangement would not simply do The republicanism of black folks could not be of the narrow political sort precisely because of the lower position of worth black people occupy, not only on the scale of political value, but cultural value as well. This issue was not merely an institutional problem, but a cultural issue that shaped habits and sensibilities and structured the precarity of black life. And being attuned to this problem, Walker and others not only came to deploy republican liberty, they ultimately transformed how to understand it. Or at least this is what I will argue in the next lecture. Again, I apologize for the length. I apologize that I'm not there. I wasn't there to deliver it in person. But thank you.